So hi, Troy. Hello. How are you? How are you? Good. Surprisingly good. It's been busy, <laughs> busy couple of days, and uh, we were celebrating Flo's birthday last night. So I'm a little bit sensitive. <laughs> Is the light okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, well, yeah, we have a lot to talk about because there's a whole new record, and, and yeah. Um, well, you did a lot of other things as well. But first, I want to start with kind of a, it's quite a general, I and mean, maybe it's not a good question, but we'll see. Um, but ever since uh, you joined with Nightwish and you made all different kinds of mu music over your career, and now you've yeah. been kind of sucked into this metal world. And uh, <laughs> recently, you did uh, something with uh, Apocalyptica. Yeah, and, yeah, um, and Sinatra Arctica as well, and a few others. Right, and then so, so what has this experience been for you to kind of become it's, part of this metal world? In I, I, I absolutely love it because I discovered that the the metal scene the the metal world as you call it is is not only is it full of integrity and genuine music lovers mm. who still want physical product who still want to look at booklets and read lyrics but it's also just brilliant fun you know and it's so diverse you know, there's so many different genres of metal i mean there's everything isn't there there's every type of metal you can imagine sure i mean umpa metal you know bavarian umpa band metal there's everything so it's it's i found myself in a really uh colorful world you know musically which is fantastic because is, is there something uh, maybe that you can share that that you've because you play a lot of instruments, you, you're, you're, a, you're a good mu musician. So that's something that you've learned from this kind of, uh, type of music, or maybe from just the last couple of years being in this uh, I think the main thing that I've learned about uh, being in Nightwish and being in the metal scene is that anything really, anything goes, mm -hmm. you know, and that I can, um, I, I enjoy the fusion of it all. I enjoy being able to take uh, less mainstream instruments into metal. Mm. Uh, not just folky instruments, but sounds as well. I like to, I like to take different atmospheres into mm. metal. Right. You know, like including uh, electric guitar. I, I get to do quite a bit of electric guitar in the band now, which okay. is really nice. Uh, just to, to back up Empu, mm. you know, because uh, Empu is a phenomenal guitar player. Um, but I like to do um, textural things, right. uh, and I come from a very progressive rock background, so right. I'm, I'm, I'm very Floydy <laughs> in my approach to that kind of thing. So um, I really delight in that, in, in being in the metal scene and subverting it with, with obscure instruments and, uh, and unusual textures. Right, because is, is there a... Um a certain feel that you're looking for in certain tracks because obviously uh Thomas also writes a lot of the uh, yeah, stuff yeah. are you are you looking for certain specific textures i mean maybe for this album in particular uh, yeah absolutely uh, and on this album especially but as a kind of um uh testing ground for the new album the last tour that we did uh, mm. the decades tour was all very old songs from the nightwish right. catalog that were reinvigorated and rearranged uh, for the band as it is now, as this six-piece band. Mm. So that was really interesting to, to uh, inject new colours into those old songs right. and make them sound a bit different while still keeping the essence of, of the songs. So again, the, the most satisfying thing is, is moving around in the metal world, but from a different angle you right know. and i just spoke to Thomas, and he mentioned that he also tried to challenge you on a, on a couple of songs with with kind of the union pipes and <laughs> yeah it's a it's a it's a common th it's it's been common uh, for the last well how long have i been playing the pipes forever but they're such a a difficult instrument mm -hmm. you know i mean not only are they, they really difficult to, to play but they're difficult to fit into uh, into certain types of music. But at the same time, they're the most um, flexible uh, and uh, I suppose they're the most eloquent sounding bagpipe. Mm. They're very lyrical sounding, so they can, they can fit into any kind of music. 
and sound sounds splendid or beautiful, but they're limited as to what you can do with them because they're fixed pitch. Even though I've got a, a custom set of pipes that I can play in any key, they're very reluctant to play in certain keys. Okay. And Thomas has a really bad habit of throwing ridiculous key signatures at me and going, what about this? And I'm like, oh, it's unplayable. He goes, oh, you'll be all right. You can do it. It's another weekend gone. Yeah, you can do it. You can do that. You can play it. And, and I go, all right then. But it's a nice challenge. And plus, I like to push the, push sure. the pipes into, into, the, into its extremes, into its limits, mm. see how far I can take it. And then, I mean, it's a good way, I suppose, for you as well to keep on learning with, with this. Yeah, instrument. definitely, definitely. I, I, on this new album, there's a song called Harvest. Sure. And it's got, it's got some really, really quite uh, acrobatic piping on it. <laughs> so, so that's going to be interesting in the live shows? Or? Yeah, it is going to be interesting in the live shows. And I, I got to sing on that one as well, which was really, really nice. Right, really then nice. That's, that's kind of the other thing I wanted to focus on, because, uh, well, Harvest is, is uh, the premier track then. But yeah. um, what, what was it like for you to use your voice, in, in a sense, in, in this prominent uh, a way for Nightwish? Because you haven't really in the past. Yeah, no, no, I hadn't. And, I was. It wasn't something that I that I um, pushed for or anything. I had no interest in singing at all in Nightwish, and uh, I was reluctant to even sing back in vocals wow. originally. But things changed, and especially on the last tour, we made the lovely discovery that the three voices mm. have a kind of beautiful texture when you put the three of them together, because Marco's voice is very full on rock, his, his classic rock voice. Right. Flo's voice is stratospheric. <laughs> and my voice is, is very, um, uh, so I've been told, is very soft. Mm. So when you put those three um, textures together, you get quite a, an interesting and, s and beautiful sound. There's a song on the album called Endlessness, and, and the, the, the chorus is just, Oh, it gets me every time, even though we, we are part of it. I, I can listen to it now without myself, and okay. it sounds really beautiful. So I'm really excited about that, the, the vocal side of things. And so, so when Thomas came to you with Harvest and, and said, well, here's this song and I, I would like you to sing it, what, what, what was that reaction like? Well, the, the original demo he sent me was, was really off the wall. Okay. You know, it, it, it really doesn't sound at all like the original demo. Okay. what we've got now right um because it it, it just wasn't it wasn't suitable mm. for it for nightwish but the idea behind it was pure nightwish you know and it's it's a big anthemic song it's very rooted in uh in folk music really it's sure. an anthemic right. chorus it's the right. kind of chorus to to sing around campfires sure you know so it's going to be nice to perform it live and then Obviously, the, the first half uh, of the record, vocals, and, and mostly the band, uh, you want to hear your voice. And, and yeah, yeah. That, that was kind of the approach. Then on the second half, it's instrumental, and then there's a lot of orchestra, so not yeah. the, less of the band, but then the Union Pipes uh, show up every once in a while, and then yeah. there's, there are these elements. So what was it like um, figuring out how to do that second instrumental bit, where I suppose you... Um, Maybe more. Maybe I'm wrong, but may, maybe more than other band members uh, have a part in because of the number of instruments you can play. Yeah, yeah. Well, that that, that was definitely a factor. Mm. In that. Flo does some wordless vocals. Right. And it, we, it was really important to disconnect uh, thematically from the first disc. Mm. It's beautiful that it's a double disc. We really like the idea mm. that you have to get up and change the disc and put another disc in. <laughs> it's very old style, but it gives people time to go and make a cup of tea before they go on the next part of the voyage kind of thing. Right. So but it's a, a story for interesting, but it's also um, kind of what you mentioned earlier about the metal audience, that they want this tangible thing, and yeah. that it's a little bit eff more effort to put it on, and you yeah, want them to yeah, be yeah. engaged with it a little bit more. It, fill, it fills me full of optimism mm. for the future. You know, the, the, uh, also I've, I've noticed recently a lot of kids are starting to reject, mm. uh, a lot of kids are starting to think, my parents lived in a completely different way to this and they they experienced things that I'm just not experiencing you know mm. most kids nowadays experience nothing but a screen in their bedroom and and they don't get out much so um i like i like that i like the physical world to be 
pushed to the forefront. Right. That's what I, w I want to see that more. I want to see people being more active in the real world rather than, you know, digitally. <laughs> I, think it's, I think it's better for the soul, you know. Right. And, and sorry I was uh, interrupting you, but you were talking about yeah. um, uh, no, I'm blanking. Uh, you were talking about uh, the, the, how, how you were more um, prominent on, on the second part, kind of the instrumental bits. Oh, yeah, so yeah. What was your approach in a way? Or what your, your, um, there, there's a piece called uh, Moors, mm. uh, and there's Illin Pipes on that. It was the only instrument that could go into that into that music. There was nothing else would, would, would have worked. Again, getting back to the the beautiful evocative nature of the Illin Pipes, how it can conjure up um, a, an atmosphere and Moors, and it was it's a wild thing, a wild place, and the pipes really work beautifully. But they also appear on Ad Astra, the very last piece as well, mm -hmm. because the pipes do have an anthemic side to them sure. as well yeah this might be a very stupid question but um it just popped into my mind just now but having played because because for someone like me i don't hear the union pipes every day or every no, day, you no, know no. for someone who's, who's been around that instrument so much um do you discover new things in it oh yeah yeah absolutely and i recently had a, a custom made set in which are completely made out of stainless steel okay uh, it's, it's really quite rare, uh, but they're a lot more stable. The Illin pipes are very temperamental mm. uh, to temperature change and things like mm. that. And even stainless steel doesn't help <laughs> that much, but it's, it's been an improvement. But um, yeah, the, what, what attracted me to the Illin pipes in the first place was when I first heard them as a kid, I had no idea what could be making the sound. I, I, th I thought it was an animal. I thought it was an animal <laughs> singing. I thought I couldn't... I couldn't imagine what could make such a sound, you know. So I was fascinated by them from from day one, and then um, as I as I uh, my dad got me my first set of pipes, and as I got deeper and deeper in there, I realised that this was a way that I could move into new areas of mm. music. I was never interested in being a folk musician, right? Ever. Uh, I was always interested in taking the pipes into new and exciting areas, especially rock music. So for a time, I had a fatwa on me from the Piping Society, <laughs> you know, for plugging in, like Bob Dylan did in the 60s. He's Judas. plugged in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Judas, Judas. So, um, but I, I absolutely revel in it. I revel right. in, in, t in playing with Apocalyptica and uh, okay. Cam uh, Camelot and Sinatra Arctica. Sure. Oh, I love doing all that. And I love doing the, you know, like the Bad Shepherds playing, uh, playing clash and playing the Ramones and mm. stuff like that and getting the pipes into that it's, it's wonderful oh, fair enough excellent um, getting back to the album then because there's uh, one kind of uh, I, I wanted to discuss the themes a little bit with, with you because uh, on endless forms most beautiful we I talked to you and we talked about how you had conversations with all of us and you yourself yeah. were very much into kind of that subject matter. Yeah, yeah yeah and this is in essence a continuation of that story it so. is uh, what kind of conversations did you have amongst the band about kind of this, this um, idea of humans and nature? And yeah, how but, well, it's interesting you should say, because The Greatest Show on Earth, the final piece on the last album, s seamlessly segues into the first track on this new album. So music comes out of The Greatest Show on Earth. I'm sure some people will do this once, once the <laughs> album's out. But the very end of all the atmospheric, uh, all the um, uh, natural uh, noise that's going on, Nat not noise, <laughs> all the natural beauty. And then it, you hear this hit on the side of a cave wall and then it becomes music. So it, so it grows out of the last. So there is a, a real continuation. And, and that was conscious, really, okay. to take it the next level and to expand on those themes that we enjoyed mm. so much, you know, in the last album. And then thematically then, because, um, well, it's about humans, it's about nature. I mean, we as humans are part of nature. We are nature, yeah. Uh, how do you see our inter... Well, we kind of touched upon it earlier, but our interaction with nature. There's there's a song on there called, uh, called Anthropocene, Anthropocene which, which, yeah. which talks about this uh, 
I think it's a time uh, distinction where yeah. from, from measuring from the moment where humans kind of impacted the yeah. earth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so what what is your uh, how do you view nature? You grew up in Cumbria, I believe. I did. I did grow up in Cumbria. Um, nature, well, it's it's. It's everything, and you know they say you can see you could you know uh, uh, a piece of grass coming through the pavement. You know, every it's everywhere, and it's mm. our life. And we, as you say, we're we're part of it. We're part of it. I do have a very holistic um, uh, view of nature. I don't just see it as being out in the woods and in the wild or in like, the sea. Mm. I, I see it as in everything. Okay. And uh, profound things that happened to me when I was a kid. You know, when I discovered Carl Sagan and. Uh, just the idea that we're all made of the same elements, you know, things like that, and that we share uh, ninety-seven percent of our DNA with a banana, you know, things like <laughs> that are just mind-blowing, and and it it takes you to a deeper understanding of nature, not so much an understanding because it's almost impossible to understand mm -hmm. that stuff, but it fills you full of awe, sure. and uh, and fires your imagination, you know, and I think it's how many chromosomes, but anyhow, we're, we're I think we're, it's some some crazy <laughs> stuff about being more closely related to yeast right. than to orangutans. That's some mad <laughs> stuff. But it's it's all beautiful and it it fills me full of inspiration, you know, right. and and makes me feel more connected. It makes me feel. And finally, then, what role does music play in this kind of? Uh, I don't know what what how to describe it. But kind of this. This juggling at that between nature and technology. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. And well, for me, it plays a, a massive, vast uh, part because of all the arts, music is is well, it's really ineffable. I mean, it, it, uh, the the idea that frequency frequency changes. Mm -hmm can make you cry or make you laugh or cause a, an emotional response is, is deep magic to me, mm. deep magic. And you know, some, some music affects me deeply and the nature, the nature of music, I'm hit with it again every time. Mm. Whenever I hear some marvelous music, I think, what is this? What, what exactly am I actually listening? Why is it doing this to me? You know, so it's whereas uh, the visual arts, uh, it's a different thing altogether. You yeah. respond through, but music's intangible. It's, mm. it's invisible. Uh, it's uh, I love it. And well, one <laughs> final thought about this then, because uh, I also hear nature being are certain practices in nature being described as a symphony kind of of, of, of uh, yeah yeah atoms and whatever the, the inner workings are. Yeah. I'm not smart enough, <laughs> but. Um, so can you see kind of the music in anything in a way? Oh, definitely, yeah. Uh, all all the uh, the great composers uh, used to say say so much, you know. And, and uh, the the English composer Delius used to uh, try to describe the flapping of wings mm. in, in music. Mm. You know, how how do you do that? <laughs> how do you do you, uh, describe a gull flying over close to the waves? And somehow, with a with an oboe and a harp, you, you do it. You can do it. Right. So how, again, it's magical. It's 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 a a mystery, and all we can do as musicians is try to to plug into it and try to make contact with that. Right. Uh, I think, um, but that's but that's a different type of music. I mean, pop music is wonderful. Sure. And uh, I've always felt that there's there's music there's music for entertainment. And then there's music for self-discovery. The two vastly separate things. They're both tightly related, but it always feels like uh, there's nothing like having a good dance around to Bon Jovi's Living on a Prayer or something. <laughs> sure. But then to go deep into the heart of Lohengrin by Wagner or, or into uh, The Lark Ascending by Vaughan Williams, that's quiet. You've got to be quiet and you've got to be on your own. And that's the journey that you've got to take. Yeah, well, one last question, then, yeah. very quickly. but. Um I don't know if you did, but w when this album was finished and you li listened to the entire thing uh, all in sequence, what, what was your kind of initial feeling? Or uh, initially, I was too self-conscious. Okay. I was I, I was in it, and, mm -hmm. and Floor and Thomas and Marco and Empu and Kai, and we were all there, and I was listening to it like that. But now, I can listen to it disconnected. I can listen to it uh, without me. So Troy <laughs> isn't in it, and I can listen to it. 
yeah. objectively, or with a, with a pure uh, a, a pure desire to find more in it mm. than I that, that I just couldn't do when I was in it. When I was, you know what I mean? Sure. Now you it, can focus on this. Yeah, thing. I can. I can focus on the whole picture rather than the Troy bits and the <laughs> Tuomas bits and the floor bits and all that. And it's wonderful. I think it's, uh, and it's the, f it's the first album I think where. I think every single moment of it does it for me. Mm. Every moment. On other albums, some bits are like better than others. But this, the whole thing, I absolutely, I love it. I love it. And I think it's, it's new and I think it's fresh. There's elements of it that haven't existed in Nightwish before, but yet it's still quintessentially Nightwish. So, which is a fine line. We haven't sure. sold out. We haven't done anything like that. We, we're still trying to push it and, and be more ambitious with what we can do with with this band, you know, with Nightwish. I think that's a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Troy, thank you very much for your time. You're very welcome. Thank you. Brilliant. Oh. Thanks, that's it. That was splendid. Oh, that's good. Thank really, you. really good thank stuff. You, you certainly you. know how to do interviews.